right you may. Okay, thank you. And um, um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, speak at, the, <clears throat> at this workshop. So what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, based on a recent paper with uh, David Lowe, where we um, basically reconsider the black hole information paradox in the context of um, holography. And um, you often hear it said that, uh, you know, once you, uh, if you are in a, a theory with a gravitational theory with a holographic dual, the black hole information problem is, is resolved. And there's a sense in which this is true in that you do have an underlying uh, unitary, manifestly unitary evolution, but then, um, this kind of turns around the problem and you then have to understand how does a semi-classical bulk description arise from the underlying uh, field theory evolution and what are its limitations? So we want to explore this um, in a context that maybe is a little bit less familiar than, than what is usually done in holography. Most of the work on black holes in holography is on large ADS black holes, which are of, these two-sided eternal black hole geometries that have uh, an interpretation in, in terms of thermal states in the, uh, in the uh, field theory. But for the information problem, you really want to think about black holes that are formed in collapse or around for a while and then, then evaporate. And that's a rather different prospect. And for that, you actually want to think about not the large ADS black holes, but small black holes, that is black holes whose area is on a scale that's small compared to the ADS scale. And we'll, we'll talk about that in, um, so that's the context, that's the uh, uh, story that I want to develop here. And um, so then our goal is then on the one hand to identify what are the uh, small black hole states? How, how do I describe them in the gauge theory? And what I will be able to tell you is how to construct states that will go on to form these black holes. Um, now, once you have the black hole, of course, that's uh, it's kind of tricky perhaps to actually, um, you know, the, the, the mapping that we know how to do between this, this uh, Hamilton, Kebat, uh, Lifshitz and Low construction works for states that are um, kind of describe either the outgoing Hawking radiation at late time. So these are kind of well separated quantile, which we can, you know, we can then build up a state. And I'll talk about this in more detail, or we can also imagine diffuse matter that's coming in and forming a black hole and that we can also construct there. And uh, we will argue that this is actually sufficient for our purposes, because once we do this and we manage to Sort of identify a subspace of the gauge theory Hilbert space, which um, accounts for the possible small black holes that you want to study. So basically can account for the entropy of those black holes. Uh, then we can basically work on this subspace. And we will argue that even though, let's say energy eigenstates of this on this subspace are actually we don't have a description of those. And um, presumably these are non-geometric and don't have a nice description. Uh, on the other hand, um, we will appeal to eigenstate, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis to see how this, we would naturally get a semi-classical bulk description for a for generic bulk observables. So that's going to be most of what I will talk about. Uh, and then once we have that, we can also use the ETH hypothesis to get a sense for what are the, when, when are the corrections to these semi-classical physics, the bulk semi-classical description, when, when are those gonna become large? When, do, when does it break down? Or, or maybe more, what I will actually show is that at least for typical observables outside a black hole, uh, they will in fact remain small for, for a typical black hole state. They can become very rare, uh, very, very large, but those states are extremely rare and, and you know, I don't think we need to worry about them too much. Um, 
Now, what we will also be, will be clear is that this semi-classical description does not apply for, for any, you know, everything there. Uh, and in fact, as soon as you start talking about, instead of thinking about expectation values of local operators in the bulk, if you really want to think about transition amplitudes, calculate S matrix elements for in states to out states, then the semi classical description will break down. And this is, of course, entirely expected. This is just a reformulation of the, of the information problem. So, on the other hand, another interesting question is what happens to things that fall into the black hole? And uh, if I, hopefully at the end, I will have time to argue, give you some arguments that one can actually use this construction also to ask questions about observations made, let's say in an infalling lab uh, that's, that's entering a large black hole. And um, there we expect these corrections also to re remain small until you hit the uh, singularity, of course, then. All right, so let's see how much of this I will, will get to, but let's first just very briefly go back and, and, and remind ourselves what the information paradox is all about. So we're going to imagine that we start with some matter in a pure quantum state that's spread out initially and has no large, doesn't uh, have any large curvature. Um, associated with it, and that, but then this uh, evolves, undergoes gravitational collapse, and we form a black hole. And then, according to Hawking's semi-classical computation, this black hole will gradually evaporate, and the final state will be outgoing thermal radiation with possibly some small Planck scale remnant left behind. That's not going to be important for, for what I have to say. Um, and then we see that um, this process appears to have evolved um, from a pure quantum state into a mixed final state. And this, of course, is, is, is not consistent with unitarity. Now, if, um, if you have an underlying unitary description in a dual theory, what this means is that the semi-classical description, the semi-classical theory is clearly getting that part of the physics wrong, so it must be breaking down. And so that's kind of where we wanna go is to see how, to, how do we understand, not so much how it breaks down, but more how it, you know, when, when can we expect it to, to work in the, in the first place. Now, but before I get there, let me also, uh, remind you a little bit of, of sort of how one can formulate this paradox a little bit more precisely. So here's a, a Penrose diagram for a, um, a semi-classical, basically this process that I was just describing to you. I've assumed spherical symmetry here for simplicity. So each point in this, this diagram is, is basically has a transverse two sphere. Uh, there's infalling matter, forms a black hole, that black hole will evaporate gradually. So there's some outgoing radiation here. And then by at the end, once the black hole has evaporated, we will have here, either this will just be empty um, Minkowski space or, or possibly they could be, this could be the world line of a, of a small remnant. So this is a semi-classical description. And then one thinks about doing um, the, an effective field theory on, on this background. So to formulate the information paradox, we assume that we have this geometry and we assume that we have a way to apply, that we can basically apply local effective field theory on anywhere where we are, as long as we stay away from regions of strong curvature. And also presumably our Cauchy surfaces are not allowed to have um, high extrinsic curvature. So, um, and the important thing is not so much the explicit form of this effective field theory. We know what the sort of leading terms are, the Einstein-Hilbert term and some uh, you know, matter fields coupled to it, but, um, and then some, presumably some uh, sequence of higher dimension operators. But the, 
the main point is that you have such a theory and that you expect contributions from these higher order terms to be uh, suppressed and highly suppressed as long as you're not, you don't have high curvatures. And you can construct uh, a set of Cauchy surfaces that satisfies these conditions. Uh, this is uh, so so-called nice slices. And you can qualitatively understand why there is particle emission here, because once you've constructed these nice slices, they will, uh, you know, these are not um, uh, the time that the generator of, of time translations from one nice slice to the next is not precisely a, a killing vector. Uh, it asymptotes to that, but but uh, it says it's not a killing vector. You, your Hamiltonian is going to be on these nice slices is going to be time dependent, and that leads to particle production. Now, this is not a very practical way to actually compute the Hawking emission, but you can kind of understand that it's uh, how, how it will come about. Now, the key point then about for the formulation of the information paradox, and I'm not going to go into this here. Uh, but simply mention that you can construct on these nice slices, you can set up uh, Gedanken experiments where you carry, you know, you prepare some, some quantum state of some EPR pairs, carry part of the pair in into the black hole and, uh, and keep the other outside. And you, you sort of, there are different ways to do this, but you can construct experiments that will imply uh, if you assume that the information comes out of the black hole, you will find that it needs to be duplicated on these slices. And um, so you can lead to a contradiction with um, between unitary evolution and, and, uh, and locality on these slices without, and this happens in a sense long before these slices uh, will encounter the strong curvature. There, of course, will inevitably be strong curvature here towards the end point where the final, when the black hole has become very small. So this is this is the uh, the, the setup that we want to think about now. And so, how do we do that in a theory with a gravity tool? Well, the theories that we know, sort of where we have well-established uh, holographic duality, these are asymptotically ADS. So it's natural to think about black holes in ADS space-time then. And there are these, as I mentioned earlier before, there are these two types of uh, black holes that or the black holes, ADS Schwarzschild black holes come in, come in kind of two uh, classes. There are the large ADS black holes, which have a positive specific heat. They are dual to thermal uh, states in, this, in the, um, in the uh, dual field theory, and they are well described. They have a geometric description in terms of two-sided um, uh, eternal black hole geometries. Now, these are not the ones that I want to think about here because I want to think about the formation of a black hole and evaporation. Now, a large ADS black hole doesn't radiate, uh, and uh, it's also very hard to, to, to set up um, its formation because it's actually much larger than the ADS scale. So, uh, so and furthermore, um, even if you could do all these things, uh, the, you have to worry about issues like the boundary conditions at infinity. How do you, so the Hawking radiation that you would emit from, from any black hole in ADS spacetime will get reflected by the curvature of the spacetime. In on a time scale that's of order the ADS length scale. And then there are issues simply about sort of the global, um, you know, how do you, how do you, you don't want to, I uh, don't want to really have to worry about those issues. So what I want to think about is a setup where I have a small black hole. Now this is going to be an unstable state in the CFT. And it's going to have a, Lifetime, if we, if I think in, in four-dimensional space-time, there's the black hole lifetime is of order m cubed, and so this will also be then a, a lifetime that I would associate with the dual state, and this means that it has a finite width in energy. And now what I want to think about is a kind of set of um, I want to think about separation of scales. So first of all, I need 
my Planck scale to be very small compared to the ABS length scale. But furthermore, I want it to be this very large separation to be such that I can accommodate black holes that are macroscopic in the sense that they're large compared to the Planck scale and will therefore have a significant amount of en entropy and, and will have a long lifetime compared to the microscopic scale. But at the same time, I want it so that this black hole lifetime is actually short compared to the ABS length scale. And then I can sort of have this collapse uh, an evaporation process can consider that in a patch of my ADS space time that um, and not have to worry about uh, what happens at infinity. So that's what I have in mind here. And um, and now I want to think about how do I actually describe holographically these black holes. So I need to think about how do I actually form one of the black holes. Well, I can send in some sort of, can prepare a state where I have some, let's say a shell of matter that undergoes collapse or a cloud of dust. And, uh, and this, I can, this I can do, I can maybe in some cases even find some analytic solutions, but this will only account for a very small number of a uh, small fraction of the possible ways to form a black hole. So just to, uh, sort of for context, if you think about the bekenstein hawking entropy of a black hole, let's say one solar mass black hole, and you compare that to the thermal entropy that's carried by the sun, you'll find that the black hole entropy is about 20 orders of magnitude larger. So you know, if I think about black holes formed by core collapse or some spherical shells collapsing, that's only, they're going to account for only a tiny fraction of the, uh, of the uh, entropy of the black hole. So if I really want to have a handle on the space of these small black hole states, I need to kind of be able to identify semi-classical bulk states that can account for the whole entropy. And Mukhanov uh, provided us with a way, you know, basically answered this question in, in some work in uh, some 20 years ago. And if you think about the reverse process, if you have already a small black hole and it's going to evaporate, then that evaporation is for, a, you know, well, basically you're maximizing the entropy of the outgoing um, matter by having it send out thermal radiation at the Hawking temperature over, a, over an extended period. And what Mukhanov showed was that if you now think about roughly states that are the time reverse of this, that is, they, you, you start with states which have a diffuse cloud, if you like, of incoming uh, radiation. And you put restrictions on you know, the, the your, your phase space so that you, 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 you count basically the number of ways you can form a black hole from radiation that's aimed inwards towards where the black hole is going to form and has the appropriate, carries the, the, uh, you know, the, the total, the, if you add up the energy of all the photons that should become the black hole mass. And then you ask, what, how do I maximize, what is, what is the, you, know, you count the number of ways you can do this and what does a typical, uh, state look like, and then that is basically ingoing thermal radiation at the Hawking temperature. That's gonna give you the, the right scaling of these variables. And so what I then want, if I want to now think about the holographic map between small black holes, rather than trying to think about a black hole state that's sort of sitting there, I wanna think about the states that, go, can, that form the black holes. I wanna take these, uh, we call them Mukhanov states, so these are states that are describing this train of radiation that's coming in. And we want to think about mapping those to um, into, the, into the field theory Hilbert space. And then we can think about evolving those states forwards using the Hamiltonian of the, of the field theory on the one hand, or we can think about evolving them forward in a semi-classical gravity theory. And we will then 
compare these evolutions. Of course, for, for a while, they will look very similar, but eventually they must diverge because of the uh, violation of unitarity in the, in the, um, on, on the bulk side. Now, because these initial states are going to be like a train of well-separated photons, uh, we can use this map from uh, HKLL, Hamilton et al, to basically we can take each wave packet of an infalling photon uh, that is, forms part of the Mukhanov state and we can map, use this construction to map that to uh, basically a, a, a non-local sort of a smeared operator on the boundary. So this is uh, sort of a picture of global ADS. We imagine we have some uh, wave packet in the bulk here. That would be an infalling photon. And um, at least when those wave packets are uh, sort of out here in, you know, close to the boundary, they are extremely well described by this construction. And it gives in terms of a, some smeared distribution of, of, of operators on the, in, the, in the boundary theory. Now, the boundary theory is a conformal theory. And so you can use the uh, conformal symmetry to actually rewrite this uh, combination of operators. And you can use free propagate, boundary propagation to uh, kind of re-express it in terms of uh, a, um, it's going to remain non-local in space, but you can kind of localize it a bit better in in in, um, in time, and we can arrange it so that uh, we can form, and then basically we add up this uh, construction for for each of the photons that are forming the black hole, and obviously this will be quite complicated, but we don't really need the details here, and this way we can form an initial state uh, at some time. Uh, that's, you know, which will then go on to evolve into forming our black hole. And then this state will then evolve into a, um, you know, assuming that the, the duality is really holds, then the, we expect this state to evolve on the, on the field theory side to a final state at late times, which will also be then an outgoing train of radiation from, from the, um, you know, will be outgoing Hawking radiation, which can also be mapped on the same way onto a, um, and then we can do the reverse and, and uh, you imagine a mapping from the field theory to a semi-classical state. So basically the early time, the initial state that we want to form the small black hole from has a good semi-classical description. Final state will also have a good semi-classical description. And uh, in between, the semi-classical description may break down, uh, but we, um, but then we have the holographic evolution, which remains well defined. Okay, I already mentioned this separation of scales that I want to work with. Um, now, so look what the picture here then is that uh, I have a when I form the black hole, let, or we can let, let's imagine the the outgoing product. So basically early on, we're gonna have some low energy radiation. The temperature goes like one over M. And, and by the way, this construction of Mukhanov, one can work it through in any number of dimensions and, uh, that, um, and the, the scaling works out. And this is important um, because uh, I've, I've glossed over a point in with these uh, small black holes, which is that of course, the black holes are perhaps not only small compared to the ADS scale, they may also be small compared to the uh, size of the transverse uh, space. And, you know, this depends on the details of the holographic setup. And if that's the case, then presumably the thing that we're going to be forming is actually more like a 10 dimensional uh, object. You know, it's localized on the, on the transverse space. And, but we could apply these arguments um, also in, in, in in 10 dimensions, so it should, this is not too much of a concern. Now, but let's just uh, keep thinking in, in, in four dimensional terms, just so that, um, you know, to keep the uh, powers that go into our scaling relation simple. 
So basically we have this train of radiation that uh, comes in over a period of, of time uh, that goes like m cubed. And it starts out as low energy, so somewhere in the infrared, and then it kind of just warms up. And of course, the final gasp of Hawking radiation is going to be very, very high energy. And so presumably, this will, uh, can be formed from the, the reverse of this. Is, so the typical Mukhanov state is going to be basically the reverse of this. That's what we have over here. And um, now, of course, the number of outgoing states, uh, Hawking states, actually the entropy of this outgoing radiation is slightly higher. It's an irre irre irreversible process, so it's a slightly higher entropy than what you have than the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. It scales the same way with, with M, but it's, um, but it's got this prefactor. And that means we will also have basically a, a, an over complete set of states here. Uh, but the important thing is what we have a large enough state uh, set of states to, to span basically a, the subspace of the Hilbert space that is the, uh, that this black holes, the, the semi-class, sorry, the small black holes uh, live in. So this is a very large dimension, of course, it's e to the m squared if, uh, for, a, uh, for the black, for a, a microscopic m here but it's important that it's a finite dimensional system. So, so this is the construction that we're going to appeal to that we can actually form initial states and we can uh, sort of have a handle on, on the size of the, or the number of such states that we, that we can form. But then the question is, how do we understand the bulk semi-classical physics arising? So for that, we're going to appeal to um, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which basically tells you that uh, if you have, you now ETH applies, uh, it's not something that's been proven, but it's been uh, argued for, for in certain, there are cases where it's been demonstrated, uh, but if you have a system that exhibits, whose classical limit exhibits dynamical chaos, uh, then um, th those are systems where you expect uh, the eigenstate summarization to apply. Now, the system that we have in mind is a, um, has a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So the Hamiltonian on the, and the Hamiltonian on that, uh, that it will evolve it forward. Now, this means the Hamiltonian can, of course, be diagonalized, and the energy eigenstates uh, will exhibit the usual regular just phase evolution, and that's not going to be chaotic. And this is true of, of any, any uh, quantum system, but the, we can understand uh, the thermalization of a system by uh, that when you're actually, so this is the, we have a, so there are some requirements. First of all, we need to think about observables that are uh, not, you know, they're not, don't correspond to symmetries. So they're not diagonal in the, in the energy eigenstate basis. And we're going to assume that we have a, uh, chaotic behavior in a semi-classical limit. Uh, now we expect this to hold for a black hole. I come to that in a minute. Uh, there should be a discrete spectrum of energy eigenstates, but it should be extremely densely spaced. And this is certainly the case for the black holes because we have a, an e to the m squared is the number of states in a, in a, over a range that's very close to, a, you know, over a rather, rather small range. So, If you have these um, conditions satisfied, then you can have a very far from equilibrium initial state that will very rapidly evolve into a state that will appear thermal. And this has been worked out quantitatively, for example, for a uh, hard sphere gas. This is um, a system that was studied in particular by Srednicki. So these ideas are originally due to Berry 
and uh, were elaborated on by Deutsch and, and Srinicki. And it's uh, the Srinicki's formulation that we will be following. So we want to think about how this uh, applies in the, in the system that we have. Okay, so we have identified a subspace of the Hilbert space that has finite dimensional. Um, it will have a very dense spectrum. And the, the dynamics that kind of scrambles the information that uh, you're sending to a black hole before it gets emitted with the Hawking radiation is, is known to be uh, quite rapid and uh, it is sufficiently rapid that you that it um, you, ex, you, know, you would characterize it as chaotic evolution. But we're simply going to take this as an assumption that, that we have a chaotic system and we're going to apply ETH to it and, uh, and see what we can, so where, where that takes us. So this is what this recent work with David Lowe was about. So we're going to think about a set of generic observables that have a well-defined classical limit. So, that, so these are now observables maybe that we want to use for to describe some bulk physics. Could be a, um, well, let me actually not specify too closely exactly what observables I'm going to look at, but rather just look at the generic behavior. So the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis basically says that we can model uh, matrix elements between energy eigenstates in the following way. Um, so we have some underlying complicated chaotic, um, at least chaotic in a classical limit evolution. And it can be modeled in a way that says that you have Basically, a matrix element between different energy eigenstates is going to involve a diagonal piece, which uh, is given by some smooth function of the energy of that, you know, that where you are at. And this smooth function of energy, of course, this is going to be the basically the semi-classical limit that in the semi-classical limit is going to be the function that describes the classical. Uh, observable that, that corresponds to the, 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 the uh, quantum observable A, okay? But there's also an off-diagonal contribution that has to do with the you know, complicated phase evolution and you know, relative phases between the uh, two, between different eigenstates. And we can motivate actually this this pre-factor here. So we've adapted the, some formulas from, from uh, Shudnicki's work to the case at hand. So the way you, so this is a rather large suppression factor here. Um, and then we have a random matrix, which we will take just to be Gaussian. And the way you can motivate this or, or estimate this suppression factor in front here is simply by demanding that if A is a generic observable, well then A squared should also be a, a, a generic observable. And then if you calculate matrix elements of A squared, well, of course you can write them, use this formula twice, uh, you will sum over the uh, intermediate states and those sums will involve, remember the dimension of the Hilbert space is, X, is e to the m squared. So there'll be an exponential or e to the s, whereas this s here is the entropy of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy as a function of, of the energy. Um, you will have an exponential number of terms, but of course, when you sum over them uh, and you use just standard properties of, of a random matrix, you will find that if that you would require precisely this suppression factor here in order for, and if you if you have that, then your expression for A squared will also be of this form. Now, let me, take a step back here. And just like when we said earlier that the energy eigenstates, they don't behave in a particularly chaotic way. It's only when you are looking at um, observables and you're working with states that have some width so that you're taking averages over a large number of these uh, eigenstates that you can expect uh, classic, well, well, 
chaotic looking behavior. And what that amounts to in our case here is that the energy eigenstates, are in fact, are not going to be classical black hole states. They are some sort of superposition of these ingoing and outgoing Mokhanov states, and they have to be averaged over, you know, basically they have to be superimposed at all different times. And uh, at least as far as we know, there really isn't any semi-classical description of a well-defined geometry. Uh, you might try to construct something like that by having a steady stream of radiation coming in and, and keeping you know, one of these black holes around, but that's not a, uh, you know, basically because of the genes instability that is not, you, know, you don't have a, the back reaction, you would get a large back reaction far away from the black hole in this case. And uh, so this is quite different from the large ADS black holes which are, have a nice geometric description and are, are you, you can use kind of standard finite temperature methods. But um, the, so we want to think about what does a typical small black hole state look like now? And it doesn't, you know, it can be a black hole that's formed by one of these Mukhanov states, but even, even if you have a state that is not, um, doesn't look thermal, um, then if ETH applies, then you expect the state to um, evolve rather rapidly into a thermal state. Now, the gravitational analog of that is you can have a spherical shell of matter or you can have some uh, core collapse of a supernova. Uh, this will form, this is not uh, a generic state, as I said earlier, the, um, but it will, once you form the black hole, it will rapidly thermalize. And so we can imagine just some, we formed some state, formed a, a small black hole, but we know that it's only gonna stick around for a lifetime of order M cubed. That means it must have an intrinsic width of order uh, one over M cubed. And this is also, you know, it's certainly by construction is true of these typical Mukhanov states that we constructed. So that means that I will have a superposition of eigenstates. So if alpha are my energy eigenstates, my typical black hole state is gonna be some superposition with a, a spread in energy that's given by the usual, you know, standard formulas. And we will take to be of order one over n cubed, okay? Now, you compare that to the level spacing, which is e to the minus m squared for this, this, this uh, space of small black hole states. And then you see this width is, is enormously larger than that. So that means we have a dense spectrum that we are averaging over, and we are averaging over a large number of energy eigenstates. And then we expect this, uh, the eigenstate summarization hypothesis to hold, provided this width here is, um, you know, it's, we, we want our um, classical, um, basically our, our, our classical limit of our observable cannot be more sharply peaked than the width of the, uh, the width of the, uh, the energy width of the state. And uh, on the other hand, for, delta E of order one over M cubed. This of course is a tiny number here. So this is really not much of a restriction for us. So we basically think, you know, generic local observables, uh, we expect this to, to hold. And now we can ask, how does, if I have two different microstates for the black hole, with each with their own um, you know, distribution, you know, some, some each their own superposition on the on the space of eigenvalues, eigenstates, sorry. And let's assume that they have the same, they form a black hole of the same mass, and, but that they have slightly different widths, basically, but both of them are of order one over n cubed. So, so there will be some order one number here, C. And we can ask, what is the difference in the, if I take the expectation value of my observable, uh, what's, you know, how, how does it differ from one microstate to the next? And then you can just 
work that out from the formulas that we have. And you'll get two pieces. One of them is a diagonal piece, which will be, um, will be time independent. And that one only depends on the energy profiles. Uh, and uh, you basically will find that they will differ by, you know, something here, which is of the, you know, differ, differ by one minus C squared factor here. So if they have exactly the same profile, then of course there will be no difference in the, in the semi-classical. Um, and this is kind of what you expect for semi-classical behavior. You expect your energy, your, your, um, your uh, observables to depend on your um, energy profile, but not much else. And, um, and so that's what we're seeing here. But of course we have um, the off diagonal terms and those come from the random matrix contribution to the, uh, to the you know, in the ETH. And so we want to see if, if, if this is the expected behavior for semi-classical gravity where you don't really see any dependence on the microstate. And then um, these fluctuations here that you might see between different states would, you would attribute to like finite size effects in your system. Uh, you want to ask, so can I be sure that these contributions are not big? There is of course a very large suppression factor here, but on the other hand, I'm also taking sums over a very large number of matrix elements. So I need to, I need to worry about that. But what you find is that if you have a typical small black hole state, you will find that actually you get very, very small. Um, you will find that they are, these microstate dependent contributions are very much suppressed. They're in fact suppressed by e to the minus s over two. Now, if you pick a very special state, uh, then this will not be the case. If you actually, if you were unlucky and your psi here happened to be the an eigenstate of this matrix and precisely happens to the, be the eigenstate with the largest eigenvalue, well, a random matrix, the eigenvalue distribution is given by the Wigner uh, semicircle law. And when you actually, if you were to plug that state in, you would find that in, you would get that the largest eigenvalue will go like, um, will in fact go like e to the uh, s over two will precisely offset this thing. And you would expect that you can and get, in fact, get order one contributions then from your uh, off diagonal. But this is of course a very special state and you can, you can sort of estimate how likely it is if you just use the Haar measure, you can ask how likely it is, is it that my coefficients will be within some small number epsilon of the coefficients that are the ones that are, you know, that give you this uh, largest eigenvalue state. And uh, you will find that the, the likelihood is actually this small number epsilon to a huge power. So, so these are extremely rare states that would give you, you know, that would break or violate the, the semi-classical description for these operators. So this is looking pretty good. Um, we seem to have a picture here that uh, we can, we've identified a subspace of our Hilbert space that describes the small black holes. And even though the energy eigenstates themselves are not really accessible and, and not nice geometries, uh, the averages that inevitably occur when you look at black holes with a finite lifetime will, uh, will uh, seem to give you a nice semi-classical picture with extremely small corrections. So let's ask some other questions. Now it's clear that this becomes rather different if you start thinking about transition amplitudes. So you think about, so we have these good semi-classical instates that I've talked about. Now the outgoing Hawking radiation at the end of the black hole evolution is also going to have a good semi-classical description. Um, be no, no large curvatures or anything involved there. And you could imagine calculating using the semi-classical theory to calculate the, well, the overlap between some, or transition amplitude between, between uh, some in-state and out-state. And there you will, you know, th this will fail miserably because the semi-classical evolution actually doesn't contain the phase, the relative phase information. So it will not implement unitarity. And this is not surprising because it's just a restatement of the informational problem. 
Uh, another set of quantities where you would expect the semi-classical uh, picture to fail would be for some non-local quantities like, um, like the entanglement entropy between the radiation and, the, and what's left of the black hole at any given time. Now, of course, in our setup, because we have this underlying unitary evolution, we know that, in fact, this is precisely the, the, the system, if you like, that, that Page had in mind when he was uh, doing his uh, computation of the page curve. So we will find, we will get a page curve, but we would be, we would not really expect the semi-classical theory to do that. But with a, with a rather, rather simple uh, prescription, uh, it's rather interesting recent work that of course has been uh, quite celebrated. Uh, you, we actually do get the page curve recovered for this kind of fine-grained quantity, which is the entanglement entropy. And this is quite surprising from a semi-classical point of view. And, um, <clears throat> and is certainly interesting and, and merits um, you know, some deeper understanding, but it doesn't really say very much about the, um, the, the information problem. You know, being able to recover one quantity is, is it's certainly, as I say, interesting and, and important, but it's not, doesn't tell you much about the underlying quantum dynamics, which is, where uh, what you need if you really want to sort of fill in the details in this problem. So to, to, to summarize, I've got a nice semi-classical picture for, you know, for certain observables, observables outside a black hole. Um, these are generic observables. There are, there are various restrictions that I haven't really talked about much here. Um, this is not going to work for conserved charges uh, because they are diagonal in the um, in, on the on the um, you know in the energy eigenstates, um, and um, there's also a limited number of since this is a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, I'm really, what I have in mind is that my observable A is kind of a complicated, it's a simple observable. It doesn't involve uh, you know, too many operators, if you like, acting on, on, on the vacuum. So it, um, but these are precisely the sort of things that go into a semi-classical description. And, um, and this kind of, I didn't mention it before, but we actually do have semi-classical models where we can evolve forward uh, form black holes and see evaporation products in a semi-classical theory. This is this one plus one dimensional CGHS model and, and its relatives. And uh, I think it would be interesting to kind of formulate this uh, story for in that context, um, if one can. And then we can maybe be more quantitative about these diagonal terms that, that I had saw there. Okay, now an important part of uh, this is for the infalling observables. Now I've run out of time, so I think I will not really go into that in any detail, but let, I can maybe very briefly say our, our strategy there is to say that, well, whatever happens to a lab that's um, uh, in, inside a lab that falls into a black hole, well, you prepare a state where the black hole, where the lab is still outside the black hole. So you can imagine working on a set of time slices that, um, are that, that apply to such a system. This was done by Corley and, and Jacobson uh, in 97. They basically formulated an effective field theory on an infalling lattice that sort of was um, based on geodesics of infalling particles. So you could imagine using such an effective field theory. That effective field theory would be then a semi-classical, and you know, the observables in that effective field theory would be precisely of the form that we have in thinking about here. Now you have a Hamiltonian in that effective field theory uh, that you can basically construct that also from, um, from um, you know, on, on, you know, outside the black hole. So you can basically, in, you can construct your observables on, on a slice or part of, part of the lattice that's outside. Then the lattice falls into the black hole 
And you can follow that evolution at least for a while until you get close to the singularity. And uh, there are some interesting uh, things that you can learn there. You will find that, for example, time evolution for these infalling oper operators is completely insensitive to things that happen more than a scrambling time earlier. I think when you translate that to what I've been saying here, that is telling you that that time evolution is not going to be sensitive to um, the, the microstate of the stuff that, it was, that went in uh, before a scrambling time earlier. And uh, so I think you can do a construction where uh, you can have an effective field theory valid on a, on a infalling lattice, and it will hold long enough to conclude that you have a good semi-classical description with, you know, that comes about from self-averaging over a large number of, of energy eigenstates. Now, of course, the eigenstates now are eigenstates of a larger black hole, which includes the laboratory that you've just sent in. Um, and then this semi-classical evolution will, of course, eventually de deviate from the holographic dual evolution. And it's interesting to try to estimate the time scale of that. And uh, from some very simplified toy models in some earlier work, we, we came up with estimates that were consistent with the failure of this semi-classical evolution with respect to the holographic dual evolution is actually on the same time scale as the, you would classically interpret yourself hitting a black hole uh, singularity. So you could kind of think of that in, in as, as two dual uh, descriptions of, of, of the uh, demise of the infalling observers. Okay, now this is just my first slide again. So I've talked about the black hole information problem in, in, in this kind of, the, the scale separation that I talked about is basically amounts to saying that we're working at large but finite n. If you go to infinite n, then, then you kind of lose, you throw out the baby with the bathwater. The Hawking effect is a finite n effect. And um, there are, yeah, and then using the HKLL construction to, to set up my, my Hilbert space and then applying ETH, I argue that we can do semi-classical physics for bulk observables and that there will be, that'll be extremely reliable for simple observables uh, outside the black hole and even be able to use it to follow what happens to infalling matter at least up until it, you know, it, it breaks down when you get too, too close to the singularity. And maybe a final point I should make here is that there is a sense in which the, this mapping to the gauge theory, of course, resolves the black hole singularity because even though our semi-classical description is breaking down, the, the field theory state will evolve forward uh, without any problem. And one expects it to evolve into a state that will describe outside, you know, outgoing Hawking radiation um, in some weakly curved geometry eventually, which is again a semi-classically, you can describe semi-classically. Okay, so let me stop here and thank